Hello. Today's video lecture will be on Salman Rushdie's The Prophet's Hair. Um, I said this in, or I, I, I wrote this in the lecture notes, for those of you who are in my class and not just watching on YouTube, but I, it bears repeating. It's almost impossible to overstate Salman Rushdie's influence on contemporary uh, world literature, contemporary British literature, Anglophone literature, post-colonial literature, post-modern literature. Salman Rushdie is huge. Um, so, I mean, his his most famous novel is The Satanic Verses, um, for which there was a fatwa uh, declared against his life. Um, so basically what that, what that meant is that um, Ayatollah Khomeini of Iran declared that any Muslim could kill Salman Rushdie and it would not be considered a sin. Um, and, and the reason for that is because of Rushdie's sort of characteristic um, playfulness with, uh, with Islam. So Rushdie is a, is a Muslim from India, but he's not, he's not a particularly conservative or devout Muslim. And in his writing, he tends to play with um, the conventions of Islam, devotion, and things like this. Um, um, his other sort of famous works include things like Midnight's Children, um, which explores the sort of division within early post-colonial India between uh, India... Uh, which is predominantly a Hindu state, and Pakistan, which is a Muslim state, um, since India and Pakistan were um, were partitioned in 1947 when India became independent of Britain. Um, so this is the world that, that Rushdie has grown up into, and so his writing reflects uh, Indian influences, it reflects... Uh, Islamic influences, it reflects uh, British influences, but then his work also reflects magical realism, which is a genre prominently developed by Latin American writers, uh, people like Gabriel Garcia Marquez, um, Isabel Allende, Rodolfo Anaya, and so on and so on. And so Rushdie has picked this up, also George Saunders, the American, one of the top American authors at the moment, who I absolutely love, um, does magical realism as well. But Rushdie picks up this, this trend of magical realism, and he really makes it part of his own work. And this is characteristically postmodern magical realism, because it challenges the ways that we know uh, realism, or the ways that we sort of understand realism. And it does it in a way that ten, that's culturally informed. Because Western realism um, tends to be fairly limiting in terms of if it hasn't physically happened in the universe, it doesn't count as realism. But magical realism incorporates elements like ghosts, the divine, the supernatural, and things like this and presents them as part of a normal, everyday experience, rather than saying, ah, oh, there's a ghost, that's crazy. You just sort of accept it as part of, as part of the everyday. Um, and we can see that influence some in the story of The Prophet's Hair, um, which is about uh, a moneylender named Hashim who comes into possession of uh, this sacred artifact, um, which is a, a strand of the Prophet Muhammad's hair, uh, uh, Muhammad being, of course, the founder of Islam. Um, and so we see in this, in this story, uh, this miraculous, the miraculous influence of this hair. Um, so Hashim, who is, at the beginning of the story, a very liberal Muslim, uh, a very secular Muslim, almost. Um, he experiences this sort of radical conversion, um, and and we get this in 
we get this very odd description of it. Um, this is on, on 3006. Uh, so, uh, a servant comes to find Hashim to bring him down to lunch. He found Hashim as Atta had left him, the same and not the same, for now the money lender looked swollen, distended. His eyes bulged even more than they always had. They were red-rimmed, and his knuckles were white. He seemed to be on the point of bursting, as though under the influence of the misappropriated relic he had filled up with some spectral fluid which might at any moment ooze uncontrollably from every bodily opening. So we get this sort of bizarre, almost inexplicable, magical influence of the prophet's hair, of this relic. And then we get, um, later on on this page and into the next page, we get this uh, image of someone who is becoming an extremely devout Muslim. Um, so he, he tells all these brutal truths to his family that he shouldn't tell them, like that he's been uh, cheating on his wife and going to prostitutes and things like this. Um, he... Uh, he uh, tries to impose these very conservative Islamic modesty standards on his daughter. Uh, he wakes them up in the morning. Uh, because, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, officially Islam requires five daily prayers, uh, one of which so it's very early, five o'clock in the morning, early by my standards. I, I'm a stay up late and sleep until the early afternoon kind of guy myself. But um, Islam requires five daily prayers, and so he wakes the, the family up and starts imposing this on them. Um, and, so, and so we get this image of this very uh, increasingly devout, conservative uh, Muslim. But Rushdie is not just giving us here is a devout conservative Muslim who has been reformed under the influence of this, of this divine relic. He also gives us someone who is still ruled by money. So the Islamic position on usury is debated. Um, there are some Islamic scholars who believe that uh, lending money with interest at all is usury and is and is not allowed under Islamic law. There are others who believe that you can lend money at a reasonable rate, um, and and different uh, different Christian sects have similar rules. Different Jews have different rules, uh, but we get on on three thousand and four. Uh, we get a reference to. Uh, Hashim's standard interest rate of over 70%, which is, by almost any religious or legal standard, usury. Um, so, officially, un under the terms of his conversion, um, or under the terms of his sort of increasing devotion to Islam, Hashim should give up money lending. Um, he should give up charging these exorbitant interest rates. But on 30, uh, on 3007, 3007, we get, uh, we get two incidents. That afternoon, a trembling debtor arrived at the house to confess his inability to pay the latest installment of interest owed, and made the mistake of reminding Hashim, in somewhat blushing fashion, blustering fashion, of the Quran's strictures against usury. The moneylender flew into a rage and attacked the fellow with one of his large collection of bullwhips. By mischance, later the same day, a second defaulter came to plead for, for time and was seen fleeing Hashim, Hashim's study with a great gash in his arm because Huma's father had called him a thief of other men's money and had tried to cut off the wretch's right hand with one of the 38 kukri knives hanging on the study walls. Um, and then later on, further down that page, uh, this is several days later, it says, that afternoon, Hashim left home accompanied by two hired thugs to extract the unpaid dues from his two insolvent clients. So, I mean, Hashim is still this sort of 
almost mafia boss figure who's demanding uh, that his extor extortionary interest rates. I was going back and forth between saying exorbitant and extortionary, um, and I went with extortionary. Uh, that his extortionary interest rates be paid. And so what Rushdie is doing here is very interesting because this is someone who is um, enforcing these strict uh, religious doctrines on his family, but he's selectively sort of not enforcing the, the strictures uh, against usury under Islamic law. And so this is, this is sort of characteristic of the way that uh, Salman Rushdie tends to play with religious belief and uh, with the rules of, of religion. Um, so, uh, I mean, Rushdie is very interesting. And, uh, and again, his, his writings in relation to Islam have gotten him into trouble. But... Again, he's he's got this very playfully postmodern approach to uh, to his own cultural position, which is as a fairly secular Muslim, uh, an Indian Muslim, and someone who has who has lived a significant portion of his life in Great Britain. So uh, again, Rushdie is a very sort of playful, fun uh, fun fellow and one of the most influential and important contemporary writers.